Surprisingly, I actually arrived at Bradford back in 1980 as an undergraduate, and uh, I, I came through the biological science system, ended up doing a PhD, and, uh, and eventually went off to become a commercial archaeological geophysicist. And uh, I ran my own company for 18 years, and we're involved very heavily with things like Time Team and, and, and other TV programs. And uh, about, oh, about seven or eight years ago, I ended up uh, selling up the company and, uh, and job sharing at Bradford for a little while. And uh, well, here I am now, uh, now running the archaeological prospection course and, uh, and also head of archaeological sciences. I started off looking at Roman villas in their landscape context, and that really hooked me on to landscape. But after a brief change of careers into museums, I felt I had to go back to archaeology. Um, I did a PhD in former Yugoslavia. I came back to Britain. I carried out landscape research in Britain, in Italy, in Croatia, um, America, North and Southern Africa. You know, it started with, with literally Vince and myself in a field next to Stonehenge and just saying, wouldn't it be great to do a huge area? It's given us a, a really unique insight into the Stonehenge landscape with collaborators from around Europe. Um, we've been able to look in between the monuments, not, not just the places that people usually look, in order to create a, a data set of a, a type British archaeology and indeed world archaeology has never seen in respect of a, a, a wonderful and uniquely important archaeological monument. I think one of the most exciting things are just the tiny little monuments that actually sometimes exist between the monuments that we know. So we've got little little henges which are probably chapels that people visited en route to Stonehenge. We've seen um, some sites that are within other sites, are hidden away, so we, we sort of completely recharacterized parts of the landscape that we just didn't really understand. But the larger scale? Well, I think the, the other thing that comes out of this is Stonehenge, and to most archaeologists, is somewhere that's set apart. It's a revered, people possibly didn't come close to it, except perhaps special people at special times. The, but the new data, because we can look everywhere in the landscape, is starting to suggest that there was a lot going in the, on in the landscape. There may have been processions, large numbers of people may mm. have turned up, actually. Uh, but we, you, can't, you can't see that just by digging small holes in, in, in monuments, which some of which stretch for three kilometres across the landscape. And what we've been doing is starting to use oil and gas data, survey data, seismic data, to provide a map of the areas underneath the North Sea. We've been doing that for nearly 10 years now. Now we're about to do something different. From going from a map, which has nothing on, essentially apart from rivers, hills, lakes, coastlines, we're going to take ships, we're going to core down river valleys, and we're going to extract DNA, paleoenvironmental evidence, and create huge models of colonization and decolonization of this land after the Ice Age, with you know, sea level rising, temperature rising, plants moving in, animals following plants, people following the animals, and we're going to do it over an area of about 60 to 90,000 square kilometres, most of which cannot be explored by archaeology using conventional means. Um, I'm going to, I think we can be quite explicit and, and honest about um, the position of Br Bradford archaeology, both in Britain and across the world. It, is, it has a very special position. It, it was at the forefront of the development of geophysics. It's always been an applied department. It's, move, it's, it's actively gone out to do innovative projects across the world. And without doubt, that, that is reflected in the standing it has within the world. People do look to Bradford to see what is happening in these areas. Vince and I have always worked together. Sometimes it's great, <laughs> other times, you know, well, you know, we're brothers. <laughs> Um, fortunately, we, we, we still support the same football team, so that's one less argument that we always have. Yeah. I, th I think there's a number of things about this. We have worked together for a long time, and you know, we confuse a, lo a, a lot of people globally, many of whom think there's only one of us. Um, and probably <laughs> moving to the same university isn't going to help that situation. Mm, not at all. <laughs> 